Hi, this is Ben Tupper. Today I'm going to introduce you to a wonderful area of math called group theory. Group theory is the study of groups. What's a group, you ask? I could tell you, but it would be better to show you. In this video, I'm going to show you an example of a group. I will explicitly spell out the definition of a group using our example as a reference. Finally, we'll see how the idea of a group expands beyond just our first example into an entire class of groups. To put it succinctly, the three sections break down as follows. Part 1, an example of a group. Part 2, the definition of a group. Part 3, a variety of groups. To find our first group, see if you can solve this challenge. Can you count all the ways a triangle can be turned or flipped so that it ends up in the exact same position? A couple of examples. You can rotate the triangle 120 degrees to the right, or doing nothing technically leaves the triangle in the same position, so let's count that as well. Take a second, pause if you like, and come back when you're ready for the answer. The answer, six. Let's count them. To help us keep track, I'll draw a smiley face here on the front side, which will have a yellow border, and a smiley face here on the back side, which will have a blue border. If we count doing nothing, that's one, then we have two rotations, right and left. Then there are three reflections, one over this line, we'll call it flip A. Over this line, we'll call it flip B. And over this line, we'll call it flip C. And that's it. These six actions together are an example of a group, which is studied in the area of math called group theory. In math, any collection of things can be called a set but here, there's clearly some special structure that sets this set apart from a mere bowl of fruit. For one, any pair of these things can be combined by doing them in succession. Combining actions is called composition. It's represented with this symbol. If we have three actions, A, B, and C, this reads A compose B equals C, which we will interpret from left to right to mean do A, then do B, and it's as if you had just done C. In the case of actions on our triangle, you might say turn right, compose, turn right, equals turn left, meaning if you turn the triangle right twice, it's as if you had just turned it left. A quick warning, even though composition is not multiplication, people sometimes say things like turn right times turn right, or the product of turn right and turn right. It's just being a little loose with the terminology. Any two actions can be composed. Left turn and right turn undo each other. They're opposites, or more formally, inverses. To use group theoretic terminology, we would say turn left, compose turn right, equals do nothing. Since flip A undoes itself, it's its own inverse. Doing it twice is the same as doing nothing. Doing nothing has a more formal name as well. It's the identity. This is just like adding zero or multiplying by one. Nothing happens. Then there are more complicated compositions. For example, flip C and turn left don't undo each other. They lead somewhere else entirely. Can you see what action they're equivalent to? Pause if you want to work it out. It's a bit hard to visualize in your head, so here's an animation. We'll perform these two operations on this triangle and see what happens. First, we'll perform flip C, then compose that with a left turn. Can you find the match? Here it is, flip B. The moral of the story is that any two of the actions we found can be composed and that the composition of any two of them is itself an action that exists within the group. Sometimes finding that action is obvious, but sometimes it can be tricky. 
I want to clarify a potential source of confusion that tripped me up when I started on this journey. The members of a group are called elements, and there are many kinds of groups, so there are many kinds of elements. In some groups, the elements are numbers. In some, they're matrices. The elements of this particular group are not objects, but actions. And these actions are called symmetries. In addition to a set of elements, a group also needs an instruction of what kind of operation to use when combining those elements. In this case, our operation is composition, which we just saw. It's the act of performing two actions in a row. Together, this set of elements and this operation make up our first example of a group. It's a group of symmetries, specifically the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. You can also call it the symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. Keep this group in mind, because it will be our reference as we talk about groups in general. Each of a group's elements has a personality, and each pair of elements has a special relationship, which in turn creates a group whose structure is determined by those personalities and relationships. Recognizing these patterns allows us to generalize from basic groups, like motions of a triangle, to more complicated groups, like the motions of a pentagon, or the structure of a crystal, or the behavior of a molecule. Group theory is rooted in algebra, but it allows us to make predictions about other areas of math and science, like geometry, topology, cryptography, chemistry, physics, and more. Chemists, for example, use group theory to classify molecules by their symmetry groups. These classifications, called point groups, help scientists make predictions about the behavior of molecules, since molecules with similar symmetries can be expected to act similarly. But there is also something intrinsically rewarding about group theory. Each group has its own quirks, its own behaviors, its own lineage, its own beauty. Personally, I'm in it for the beauty. Now that we've seen an example of a group, we're ready to start building a definition of a group. It's going to seem weirdly broad at first, but part of the beauty of the definition of a group is how permissive it is, the variety of groups it allows for. The last thing we noticed about the group of symmetries of an equilateral triangle is that it has a set of elements and an operation. This is actually the first and most basic requirement of any group. A group is a set of elements and an operation that combines those elements. Obviously, this is very broad. There are four other necessary conditions to be met in order to be called a group. The first is closure. Closure is the first necessary property of a group. It means what happens in the group stays in the group. In the case of our group of symmetries of a triangle, composing any two symmetries makes a symmetry. So we say the set of elements of the group is closed under composition. Even cutting it down to just the identity and these rotations would be okay. This set is closed as well. What do you know? A group inside a group. On the other hand, just the set of reflections is not closed. If you compose a reflection with itself, you get the identity, which is not in the set. Not closed, not a group. So we can add to our definition. A group is a set of elements and an operation that meet these conditions. First, the set of elements of the group is closed under the operation. I'll make up a little symbol for closed, and here's how you would represent closure symbolically. If A and B are both elements of a group G, then their product under the group operation is an element of the group as well. The next property we require is that the group has an identity element. This is the do nothing action. In the case of our group of symmetries on a triangle, it's the action that doesn't move the triangle. Think of multiplying by one or adding zero. A group's got a rest now and then. So there's our second condition. Our group needs an identity. Here, I'll use a one to represent the identity. The formal expression of this requirement looks like this. There is an element E 
in the group G such that for all elements A in the group, EA equals AE equals A. It's convention to use the letter E to stand for identity, not because it's related to Euler's number, it's not, but because it stands for Einheit, which is German for unity. Next, the undo action, also known as the inverse. We saw this when we composed certain symmetries of our triangle. Turn right and turn left are each other's inverses. Doing them both in succession accomplishes nothing. Another way of saying this is that two elements are each other's inverses if their product is the identity. The product of any flip with itself is the identity, so each flip is its own inverse. And the identity is its own inverse, since the product of the identity and the identity is the identity. This is our third necessary condition to be a group. Every element of the group has an inverse. That is, for every element A in the group G, there is an element B in G, such that AB equals the identity E. And then we come to our fourth and final property, associativity. This says it doesn't matter how we group our elements, so long as we don't mess with their order. Consider adding integers. If you add three numbers together, you can put the parentheses here or here. You get the same result either way. Or if you compose some symmetries of our triangle, you can group them however you like, and you'll get the same result. Here's an example of two ways to group a set of three symmetries. The first expression evaluates like this. And here's the second one evaluated. Since the composition operation is associative, both evaluations come to the same result. Let's add associativity to the list as our fourth and final requirement. To put this formally, we say, for all elements A, B, and C in group G, the product of A, B times C equals A times the product of B and C. To summarize, here's what it takes to be a group. A group is a set of elements and an operation. The set of elements is closed under the operation, so the product of any two elements in the set is also an element in the set. There's an identity element that does nothing. Every element has an inverse, something that undoes what it does. And the operation is associative, meaning, so long as you don't reorder elements, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. Now that we have a full definition of a group, let's go group hunting. What's the most natural way to find more groups? We start from what we know. Let's generalize from the group we already have, the group of symmetries of a triangle. How did we make this group? We collected all the symmetries of a triangle, threw in the composition operation, and checked that the four axioms were met. We can play this game with any shape though some of the resulting groups are more interesting than others. Take Mr. Squiggle. Mr. Squiggle is a wonderful polygon, but he has no reflectional symmetries and he has no rotational symmetries. His only symmetry is the identity. This is called a trivial group. It technically fulfills the four requirements of a group, but it's not terribly interesting. To find more interesting groups, we want shapes that are in a way, more symmetrical. Consider this spinny shape. Like our triangle, it has two rotations and an identity. Unlike our triangle, it doesn't have any reflections. Still, I claim that this set of symmetries meets the four requirements needed to be a group. Closure, an identity, inverses for each element and associativity. If you want to be thorough, I encourage you to pause and convince yourself that each of these requirements is in fact satisfied. Indeed, this set of symmetries forms a group whose operation is composition. Following this pattern, we see we have a whole class of groups. The symmetries of these shapes comprise the most basic kind of group, cyclic groups, as in 
a cycle. Here's the notation we use to describe them. C2, C3, and so on, where the subscript refers to the number of elements in the group, that is, the order of the group. Cyclic groups come in any order. Things really get going when you look at regular polygons. We saw the group of symmetries on an equilateral triangle, but you can make a group from the symmetries of a square, a regular pentagon, and so on. The more edges, the more symmetries, the more complex the group. All these groups together form another class. They are called dihedral groups. Dihedral meaning two-faced. Here's the notation we use to describe dihedral groups. D3 is the group of symmetries of a triangle, D4 is the group of symmetries of a square, and so on. Here the subscript refers to the number of sides on the corresponding polygon. The order of the group is twice that. Remember that these groups are not the shapes themselves, just collections of actions. So D6 is not just the symmetry group of a hexagon, it's also the symmetry group of an asterisk, a Star of David, and a benzene ring. That means you can find a corresponding symmetry group for any shape or object. The symmetry group of Mr. Squiggles is pretty tame, while the symmetry group of a soccer ball is exceedingly complex. These are just a few kinds of groups, and they involve collecting the symmetries of a shape to make a group. Groups formed in this way are called symmetry groups, but there are many other kinds of groups. There's nothing in the four axioms of a group that says the elements of a group have to be symmetries of a shape. For instance, there's another kind of group that has permutations of things as its elements. Another uses invertible matrices. Even the integers on the number line are a group whose operation is addition. Groups are everywhere. If you start looking, you'll find cyclic groups and dihedral groups, and maybe even groups of a more abstract character. Say, how many ways can you reorder places at a table? And what chord changes or intervals are in a piece of music? To review, in this video, we introduced an example of a group, the symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. We spelled out the definition of a group using this example, and we generalize to a few classes of symmetry groups, noticing that the axioms of the group still held, even in these more general cases. There are so many beautiful ways of looking at groups that I cannot go into here. There are diagrams of groups that become more beautiful as they grow more complex. I guess it shouldn't be surprising that a subject whose focus is symmetry generates beautiful figures when you visualize it. For other resources on group theory, I have three recommendations, each for a different level of interest. If you just want to see some beautiful visualizations with clear explanations, I recommend the three blue, one brown video, group theory, abstraction, and the 196,883 dimensional monster. There's a delightful textbook called Visual Group Theory by Nathan Carter. He does a wonderful job making the concepts of group theory visually pleasing and accessible. The book is written in plain English, but it builds to more advanced topics like Silo theory and Galois theory. If you're interested in something more in depth, and this is what got me deeply interested, there's a YouTube series of recorded lectures of an abstract algebra class taught by Professor Benedict Gross at Harvard. He's a passionate lecturer, and the course is thorough and quite challenging. I hope I piqued your curiosity. Now go out and find some groups.